This is the second of two videos that I um, have made for Lesson 9-1. Uh, so this is a continuation of Video 1, and so the learning targets that we want to hit in this video are 1. We want to be able to learn how to test a population correlation coefficient row using a table. We want to learn how to perform a hypothesis test for a population correlation coefficient row. So that little symbol there is row. And then third, we want to learn how to distinguish between correlation and causation. So there's a table in our appendix that we're going to need to access here to be able to do these uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. And I have little parts of that table in this video um, on one of these slides or on some of these slides. So once a sample correlation coefficient has been calculated, and we learned how to do that by hand with all those tedious calculations in the first video, we want to determine whether there's enough evidence to decide that the population correlation coefficient row is significant at a particular level of significance. So we're going to be given that alpha level again. So the table that we are interested in finding is table 11, which can be found in Appendix B in MyLabs Plus. And the general rule is that if when we look at the absolute value of R, so that means that if R is negative, just ignore its negative sign. If the absolute value of R is greater than the critical value, then there's enough evidence to decide that the correlation coefficient rho is significant. Let's demonstrate. In this example, determine whether rho is significant for five pairs of data, so n is five, using a level of significance of 0 0.01. And let's say that our r value, excuse me, um, we, let's use our table, excuse me, to find the critical value to see if our R value is out beyond that critical value. So first what we have to do is go to the table and we have to find our level of significance at the top. So our alpha level in this case is 0 0.01. Then we need to go down the far left column where we see it's labeled N and we need to find our sample size, the number of pairs of data that we have, in this case, five. And where the, this row and this column intersect one another is where we will find our critical value. Okay? So what that basically means is if we're doing a hypothesis test about the population correlation coefficient row, what we would need to find is that our correlation coefficient is out beyond 0.959. If it is, then our correlation coefficient is significant. If it is not, then our correlation coefficient is not significant. So basically what we're doing when we're using a table to test a population correlation coefficient is first we're determining the number of pairs of data in our sample. And in this last example there were five pairs. So we're basically finding n. Second, we're identifying that level of significance, alpha. And that's typically we know given to us in the stem of the problem. And then third, we're using those two pieces of information, n and alpha, to find the critical value in our table. Fourth, we look at that critical value and compare our R value to it and decide if the correlation is significant. And the way we decide that is we look to see is the absolute value of R in our sample greater than that critical value. If so, then it's significant. If not, then it's not significant. There's not enough evidence to support the, that the correlation is significant. And then finally, we want to interpret our decision, just like always, 
in the context of the original claim. So let's take a look at an example where we follow through on this five-step press. We looked at the Old Faithful data here previously. We had 25 pairs of data, and we found a correlation coefficient equal to 0.979. The question is, is that correlation coefficient significant using an alpha level of 0.05? So we go to our table, and we find 0.05 alpha level at the top, and then we go down to the far left column where we find our n values and where that row containing n equals 25 and column containing alpha equals 0.05 intersect is our critical value. So basically, we only needed our correlation to be greater than 0.396 to be able to have significant evidence to say that there is a linear relationship between the duration of Old Faithful eruptions and the time between those eruptions. So we clearly have an R value that is a lot greater than that critical value. So we can reject the null when it comes time for us to carry out the hypothesis test in its full form. So let's introduce a little bit about that hypothesis test in its full form. A hypothesis test can also be used to determine whether the sample correlation, R, provides enough evidence to conclude that the population correlation, rho, is significant at a particular level of significance. Now, just like our other hypothesis tests, our hypothesis tests can be one-tailed or they can be two-tailed, depending upon the, how the problem is stated. If it's one-tailed, then it might be left-tailed or it might be right. And you're going to notice some similarities here. It's left-tailed if we use a less than in the alternative. And it's right-tailed if we use a greater than in the alternative. On the other hand, it's two-tailed, just like previously, if we use a not equal to in the alternative. So that isn't changing at all from what we uh, were doing in our previous hypothesis tests. And by the way, some of my um, notations did not come through. For a left-tailed test, we know the complement of less than is greater than or equal to. For a right-tailed test, we know the complement of greater than is less than or equal to. And my two-tailed test um, form, format came through. We know the statement of equality is always in the null hypothesis. There's never an equal sign with that inequality in the alternative. So the type of test that we run for correlation coefficient is a t-test. Now we also used a t-test when we were testing for a mean when we didn't know the standard deviation of the population. Here's a second setting where a t-test or the t-distribution is appropriate. So we use a t-test to determine whether the correlation between our two variables is significant. Our test statistic is our sample correlation. What we do to compute our t-test statistic, our standardized test statistic, is this formula you see displayed here. We'll demonstrate here in a moment. And what's unique about this type of test is that our degrees of freedom are not n minus 1, but rather n minus 2. In our text, we will only be carrying out two-tailed tests. So in our HA, we're going to always have not equal to. We're not going to have any less thans or greater thans. Our focus is just going to be on two-tailed tests. So, the process in these hypotheses tests are, first, we're going to state our null and our alternative hypotheses, okay? Second, we're going to identify what level of significance is given, alpha. Third, we're going to identify our degrees of freedom, which again is a little unique here, n minus 2. Fourth, 
We're going to determine our critical value using table 5 in the appendix. Fifth, we're going to find the te standardized test statistic using that formula we just saw on a previous slide. Sixth, we're going to make a decision whether we're rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. And that's going to depend upon whether or not our standardized test statistic T is in the rejection region. Okay. Seventh, we're going to find a critical value. And then make a decision. All right. So. We previously looked at this data as well, where we were comparing, looking to see if there was a relationship between the gross domestic product and carbon dioxide emissions. And we calculated an R value equal to 0.882. We want to test the significance of this correlation coefficient. So we want to see if it's going to be in the critical region. And in this hypothesis test, we're given an alpha level of 0.8. Oh, 0.05. First, we're going to need to state our ho and our ha. And again, remember for our purposes here, we're always going to be doing two-tailed tests. So in our alternative, we're going to say that rho is not equal to zero. And in our, our null, we're going to say that rho is equal to zero. Now you might ask, why zero? Well, think again about what we learned about the basics of correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient can be any number between negative one and positive one. We know that when correlation is close to one or negative one, then there's a very strong linear relationship between the two variables. On the other hand, we learned that when correlation is close to zero, there's very little linear relationship between the two variables. So we're testing to try to see if we have evidence to say that there is a strong association between the two variables. So in our null hypothesis, we're going to say there isn't a so strong association. And that's the same as saying correlation is zero. Okay? Our alternative we're saying there is a strong association, and that's saying it's not equal to zero. So that's why we use zero in our ho and ha for this type of a t-test. And we were also given an alpha level of 0.05. And our sample size was 10, so our degrees of freedom will be 10 minus 2, which is 8. Okay? Now... We've got to find our rejection region, uh, which we would get by looking at our table. Now, with two-tailed tests, we remember what we have to do is we have to take that alpha level of 0.05 and we have to cut it in half, just like we did in our previous hypothesis tests for two-tailed tests. So if you cut 0.05 in half, you get 0.025. So in the right tail, you have an area of 0.025, and in the left tail, you have an area of 0.025. So if you go to your table and you look up an alpha at the top of 0.025, go down to your sample size of 10, you'll find a critical value equal to 2.306. So that means that if our test statistic ends up being out beyond 2.306 or in our case out beyond negative 2.306 since we're doing a two-tailed test then we will be in the rejection region and we will reject the null hypothesis. So the next thing we need to do is see if our test statistic is in that critical region. So to find our test statistic we remember we find T by taking R 0.882 dividing by the square root of 1 minus r squared, so that would be 1 minus 0.882 squared 
and then that is divided by our degrees of freedom, 10 minus 2, which is 8. Now type this in with me on your calculator, but you should end up with a t-test statistic equal to 5.294. Clearly we can see that 5.294 is out well beyond our upper critical value of 2.306, and that's why we will be rejecting the null hypothesis. We can say that at the 5% level of significance, there is enough evidence to conclude that there's a significant linear relationship between gross domestic products and carbon dioxide emissions. Now there's one caution here that we need to be very aware of, and that is that just because you might carry out a hypothesis test and find that you've got evidence to say that there's a strong association between those two variables, that does not necessarily mean that there is a cause-effect relationship between them. Okay? So the fact that the two variables are strongly correlated does not in itself imply a cause and effect relationship. If there's significant correlation between two variables, you've got to consider the following two possibilities. Okay? Is there a direct cause and effect relationship between the variables or not? Okay? Does X cause Y? Second, is there a reverse cause-effect relationship before, between the two variables? Does Y cause X? Third, is it possible that the relationship between the two variables can be caused by a third variable or a combination of several other variables? These are questions you need to ask yourself if it's reasonable to respond yes to them. Four, is it possible that the re relationship between the two variables is merely a coincidence? So I caution you about reaching the conclusion that there's a cause-effect relationship after rejecting the null in a hypothesis test for a population correlation coefficient. Okay? There are, there's, a, there's a lot of possible different scenarios um, that I'm not going to get into here, um, but just because you have significant evidence to say that there's a linear relationship between the two variables does not mean that you can say that one variable is causing the other variable to behave in the manner in which it's behaving. And rather than just leave it at that, I want to give an example. Uh, this is an example of one that might address this third question. Is it possible that there's a third variable or a combination of several other variables? We might find that the, um, the number of drownings at the beach is significantly correlated with the number, the amount of ice cream sales at the beach. So the number of drownings is strongly associated with ice cream sales. Now you might say, what do ice cream sales have to do with drownings? It seems very little, right? Well, think about something that might be happening on a day at the beach if the number of drownings is increasing and ice cream sales are increasing. Like for, entrance, infant, like for instance, um, it might be really hot. It might be a hot day. Well, if it's a hot day, more people are getting into the water to swim, hence producing the possibility of a greater number of drownings. And also if it's a hot day, ice cream sales are gonna go up because people like to eat something cold when it's really hot outside. And so, this is an example of one where even though we may have found that there was a significant relationship between the number of drownings and the amount of ice cream sales, it wasn't because they were highly correlated with one another, but rather because 
the temperature outside side was what was affecting those two variables. And so again, cause effect is not a conclusion we would want to reach in this case. So remember, two variables may be highly correlated, yet we cannot necessarily determine that there's a cause-effect relationship between them.